screen, I have my web page. Um, so, but before I get started on that, let me just give you a basic introduction. Um, I have been a librarian forever. Um, I am retired, but let me tell you, you never stop being a librarian. It's just in your blood. Um, I've worked in a few different libraries, but my most of my career was spent at Gananda Central School. When I started there, it was a kindergarten through 12th grade school, uh, newly formed in 1972, 73, something like that. I started in 1981, and it was the first year that we graduated a senior class. Um, when I started there, the class sizes were about 20. And when I retired uh, 36 years later, it, the classes were up to about 80 or 90 in size. Um, I had 10 years uh, experience with uh, total uh, with um, elementary, and I have 36, uh, 26 years experience with secondary. Uh, a lot of my resources are directed at secondary, but I do uh, have put significant numbers for elementary. So I think um, and uh, elementary teachers and librarians are wonderful at adapting things. So I'm sure that it will be useful for all levels. All right, with all that said, up here is my web address and uh, wanderingbooknot.weebly.com. Once you get there, uh, look for the um, link that says workshop and go over to web evaluation and click. Okay, are there really whales in Minnesota? Okay, excuse me while I cough. All of you know how important it is um, to teach a student how to be savvy about what websites that they use. Um, even adults are have been fooled. This, for instance, tells about Lake Michigan whale watching. Well, you as an adult realize that there are no whales in Lake Michigan. Your kids probably might not, especially the younger ones. And I know for a fact there was an article about a, um, a mother and, I'm sorry, a daughter and her elderly mother who planned a trip to Michigan and happened upon this website and were shocked when they got there to discover that there really were no uh, no whales in Lake Michigan. So anyway, um, we're going to get started here. I'm going to skip the agenda. That's for my in-person workshops. And we're going to go right to overview. <coughs> All right, overview. <clears throat> now this is a PowerPoint that I created uh, for a teacher workshop that I did. And I presented to um, just uh, not just to my school, I was in high school at the time, but to the whole district. So it was aimed at um, all levels, elementary through high school. So I'm going to click there and I'm going to go down here in my downloads and we'll open up my PowerPoint, which should open momentarily, I hope. There we go. <clears throat> My computer's been a little slow with PowerPoint lately. I don't know why. Here we are. Okay. So let me see slideshow from start. Okay. Web evaluation, are there really whales in Minnesota? I loved it when um, Gilbert came out with this particular um, cartoon. And uh, so I think it uh, kind of demonstrates why um, you need to be savvy on the, on the net because not everyone is smart on the web and not everybody is honest on the web. And it's a good thing to teach your teachers as well as your students. Getting credit. This slide is based on the original created by Joyce Valenza. 
Okay, we're not in Canvas anymore. Why is it important to evaluate web pages? Because your house is landed in odds without a map. <clears throat> Unlike the landed book, the web has no editors and fact checkers. That is your job, and even scarier, it is the job of your students. And we all know how uh, naive they can be and how much trust they put in Google. Because there are lots of web writers who are out to fool you and your students. There's um, a, a uh, trend in information literacy from EasyBib that <coughs> shows a little bit about the increase of plagiarism, um, which is another um, issue with kids using the internet. Examples. So less than good, unreliable, but fairly harmless websites. Who is the author of this site and what organization is in charge? Now, I do talk to the kids about looking at a web um, address and making some um, conclusions from that. And this is a .org, which they tend to trust. And it has the word library in it. So let's, I always show them this. They have a look, and they see that it's airport security. But I've told them to be, be careful to check out the source who is writing the information. And when they click on About Us, they discover that the information is written by Alex and several other students who are about 10 and 11 years old. High school students immediately understand and they laugh um, and realize, oh, we really need to be looking at who's writing the information might not be quite so clear to middle school and elementary school who you know, think that their uh, cohorts are, are smart enough. Um, but I talked to them about, yes, you do look at the website, but uh, um, this particular one is a um, contest for kids to create their own pages. So <coughs> uh, to be cautious of that, let me go back to the PowerPoint here. So uh, we talk about um, the organization and the author and what the organization's purpose is. The bad, so outrageous, they are funny, but they can still catch your kids. This one actually came from um, a, a paper I was grading the uh, work cited for. And the student's topic was the history of vampires. And granted, it is somewhat difficult and tricky to find reliable sources for that particular subject. But she thought this was pretty reliable, and uh, just in case you didn't know it, evidently there's a federal agency that uh, covers vampires and zombies. Clones are us. <coughs> I'm not sure if I can get to this one or not. Yes, clones are us is a good uh, example to use. It looks very um, authentic. And it talks about um, different, um, it gives, and this is just a, um, a copy of it. It no longer is in existence. But uh, it is supposed to be providing clones. And so people have, you have to teach your students to be aware that um, some claims are just impossible. RYT Hospital, that unfortunately is um, not um, not uh, up and running anymore in this particular format. I believe I have it a little bit later to show you. That one was very was one that really could trick adults. <clears throat> Some are uh, websites are who knows. This is a, a website about William Shakespeare from hyperhistory.net. But when you do some exploration, you discover that the articles are published anonymously, and you have no idea who the authors are. I emphasize with the kids that they cannot use a website unless they can verify the authority of the writer. All right, and then there's the downright dangerous. There's cocaine.org. Shows up within the first three sites, which results in virtually every search engine, although I did notice it's being pushed further down the list. Uh, let me go back to this one. I'm just going to show you this one. There's cocaine.org. 
in search of the Big Bang, what is crack cocaine? And it starts off as it seems a uh, history of it, but it gets a little more questionable as you go down. When is the best? When is it best to take crack cocaine? And finally, my particular favorite, the good drug guy, the responsible parents guy to help you move boosters for all the family. Something that just warm your heart. Uh, that was uh, actually uh, a student was doing a report for health test, and they called me over and pointed this out to me. And I said, uh, obviously, it has an agenda that isn't going to fit your research project. Then there's Martin Luther King Jr. and probably most of you have seen this. I'm not going to go there. It <clears throat> looks at first to be um, a um, website about Martin Martin Luther King at the .org, but when you search a little further, you find that the group responsible for the page is Stormfront.org, a white supremacy group. I think that the family of Martin Luther King Jr. must be just livid over this. It's just a nasty piece of work. <clears throat> what about Wikipedia? Is there a problem? Uh, it's temporary spoke to Dr. Mark. I would not want to use an encyclopedia that would accept me as a contributor. Inaccuracies, sometimes blatant and purposeful. There's vandalism by contributors. As a matter of fact, our particular school, high school, was banned from Wikipedia for a time because they were doing so much uh, vandalism to the site. Should we let students use it? I will tell you, it is often the only encyclopedia with any information at all about very current events. And so uh, I know uh, for an environmental, big environmental project we had, there were things that um, just weren't uh, in any traditional encyclopedia except Wikipedia. It does provide links to other more reliable or more detailed sources. And let's face it, students are going to use it no matter what the adults say. So educators need to use them, uh, teach them how to use it with caution and how to use it as a starting point. But it is definitely not the be all and end all. As a matter of fact, when we give students a total number, a minimum total of sources that they are to use, they can use Wikipedia, but they cannot count it towards their minimum total. <clears throat> Okay, my personal opinion is I think it's okay to use Wikipedia, but again, as a place to begin. Uh, older students, they can, they can understand that. They're a little bit getting more skeptical. They're less naive than middle school and elementary. But they're lazy, let's face it. They often don't want to take time to, uh, to compare Wikipedia with more reliable sources. But they at least understand what you're talking about. High school teachers, make sure your students know that Wikipedia can be used, but it will not count towards your minimum total of sources. College professors will laugh at a paper that cites or depends heavily on Wikipedia. And elementary students and middle school students are just not so sure, perhaps not so much because they um, are just more naive. Um, so that's something for you and your teachers to make a decision on. There's other, some other resources here. This is the link to my, uh, uh, let's see, yeah, to my uh, website on evaluation. And oh, this is a wonderful uh, resource that I'm going to get to a little bit later in the talk. Okay, so hey there, have you evaluated? Is that site good enough to cite? Now this part is quite similar to what I showed students. <clears throat> So uh, it's your job as a researcher to look for quality. So I show this to students and, and emphasize questioning authority and what they should ask about credibility and authority. Who is the author? Why is he or she an expert? This is a personal page. And I give them clues in the address of what might indicate a personal page. Although I also emphasize to them that not all personal pages are bad. Some are written by true experts, but again, you always have to check into the credentials of the author. Um, is it part of a major in institution? Uh, so even something uh, that you find an article in National Geographic that perhaps doesn't have an author listed, if National Geographic is listing it, um, they, it probably is reliable. 
there's a whole page hosted by a free server like AOL Members or GeoCities or Weebly for that matter. Look for credibility clues. Look for words and phrases such as about us, FAQ, company information, and so on and so forth. And I do emphasize to ask your teacher librarian for help. That you know, it, it doesn't mean that you don't know what you're doing. It just means that you are searching out extra um, verification that this is a good quality site. You can also sometimes learn about a page, a specific page, by truncating the URL. So if you have this page about the plague, you can truncate it back to the .edu, take a look at what the organization is, and you'll find out that it is a medical center. Um, so we, I go through what you can learn from a URL, and I'm emphasizing that this strategy is not always accurate, and actually it's becoming less accurate, I think, but it's a place to start. They all are familiar with the .com, and, but I tell them don't, um, don't discount the .com, National Geographic is a .com. There's .gov, there's .org, .edu, uh, .edu I warn them about because very often it is a K-12 school posting some information for um, a page written by a student and so on. But it's just one clue that you can use. So then I go with, over with the students. Um, I ask them to look at these and point out some clues that might lead to, oh, this is a good site, oh, it might not be so, so good. Reliability. Does the source present a particular point of view or bias? Sometimes the bias is useful if you're writing a persuasive essay, but perhaps not so much for a research a strict research paper. So recognizing bias is very important. The other thing um, I tell the kids, I, um, there are a lot of projects that are debate oriented, and so it's good to know the bias, and it's good to know both sides so that you are prepared to debate. How relevant is it to um, your hypothesis or your thesis? Does the source give you enough information or should you go on and find something more useful? Date, when was the information created, revised, and be suspicious of undated material, but I find this is the worst fault of websites is um, really putting the date that information was actually written. It is tough. And so I asked the kids, why should we care about all of this? And if the bigger question than school is, when they are grown up, which car should I buy? What doctor should you choose? What about surgery that you're planning to have or your child is plan uh, uh, needs to have? What about the medications? There are important questions where you need to know whether it's reliable and credible. Um, evaluation is important. Learn to be fussy. So let me go back to this page. And I'm going to get rid of some of these. Pages that have opened up. Okay, so that's the overview. And uh, basically, as I said, I created it for teachers, and also the last part of it I used with students. On here, I've also got other resources. So take a look at this page. I put a lot of resources for you to use here. Uh, readings to start with, The Web Teaching Zach to Think. This is an excellent article. It's quite old, it's from 1998. But it's still very good about uh, to, to sort of get the perspective of a student and how they think and the naive, naivety that they have uh, that they bring to the web. Um, this is a, uh, uh, it's a news article about the two people that were fooled about visiting Mankato and expecting to find whales. Hoax Buster sites are good to recommend to teachers and students. Their Snopes is quite a common one. Factcheck.org, there are probably others. Um, there are juried web search engines, such as Infotopia and Sweet Search. There's another one called for elementary called Kids Search. Those are good um, to use too, but it's they're not 100% um, reliable, but they probably are more so than quite a bit more so than Google. 
um, sometimes when we have looked up subjects that seem to bring up a lot of things that um, are selling you something, we've uh, I've had the kids switch to Infotopia because it will it's more research based. So that's an option for you. I've put a lot of resources here for elementary le uh, level, but I read it on the internet by T Tony Buzzio. That's an excellent source. This is a book that she has come out uh, that she's written recently and uh, would be, oops, sorry about that. Let's just go back and, oh, I can't get rid of it. Excuse me while I try to redo this. There we go. There we go. Okay, sometimes it just does that. <laughs> Let me make my screen bigger as well while I'm at it. All right. Um, so I highly recommend this by Tony Buzzio. There's Kathy Schrock's Guides for Educators. There's Quick Quality Information Checklist. This is uh, a really good source. And it's a bit lengthy, but it works for middle school and elementary um, students. And high school as well. Both of are not, there's, um, there's just quite a few sources for you to check out here. Here's one that I highly recommend for, I could put it under elementary, even though it is published by a college library. But I think upper elementary could handle it. It's very short. It takes 10 minutes. And it's very good at evaluating. It's just a quick, um, just a quick little um, tutorial. When I go to next, and it tells you what they're going to be learning. It'll take about 10 minutes. And it asks questions. Do you think um, chicken feathers can be used for the production of all automobiles? If you say false, sometimes the truth is stranger than fiction. If you say true, it gives you a different answer, and you go on to the next. And it goes through all kinds of different um, things that you might find on the web. On the uh, web. All right. So. Um, it can take 10 minutes to run that at the uh, at start of an evaluation lesson. You just have the kids go through it and form their own ideas about what they need to do to be web savvy. I have many of the same uh, resources under middle school, but some extra ones as well that are a little more sophisticated. And again, under high school. Okay, down here um, there is an excellent YouTube. Um, which I will not show because I, it will not show up. Let's get rid of this. And um, okay, I'm going to go up to the top now. Um, scholarly versus popular. That was one thing I um, emphasized with my students when teaching them how to use periodicals, whether they were online or from a database. And it goes over the concept of peer review in five minutes on a YouTube. And this is a more lengthy one presented by a college professor. And this is a short one uh, from Vanderbilt University. All three of these are very useful for your students. All right, now I'm getting to the crux of things here. You'll notice I have evaluation activities and evaluation activities private. I'm going to go to the private one. Right now it is open to everybody. I'm going to leave it that way for about a week or 10 days, let's say 10 days. And then I'm going to go back and put a password uh, protection on it. Um, it's only because, oh, it already it is uh, password protection uh, protected. OK, let me see if I can get in. I thought I had removed it. Okay, I'm going to log in. I will remove that uh, protection from it uh, so that you can get in there for about 10 days, and then I'll put it back on again. The evaluation activity, the plain one, is very similar, but it's missing a couple of things here that I do not have permission to share with 
the world. I can sh- I have permission to share it with you guys, but not with everybody in the world. So that's why I'm not giving out the password. All right, this is uh, the PowerPoint that I've used with high school students, very similar to the one that I just showed you. And this is kind of the cornerstone of how I hold my students accountable. Oops, I'm going to have to do this. Okay, this is a rubric um, that I created for work cited. Now, keep in mind, my school was very small. Um, there was about 350 students, um, 9 through 12, my high school. And <laughs> so what I did is I was able to do units with the ninth graders, the 10th graders, and then I checked in again with them as, as 12th graders. And I gave a grade for every work cited list done for those um, English projects, English term papers. We have a major term paper for 9th graders, 10th graders, and 12th graders. Let me just increase the size of this. All right, here we are. Works cited performance rubric grades 9 through 12. And sometimes I would adjust this depending on the age. Um, you can adjust the amount of um, total that you have to have for um, the for a superior grade. And over here, I would put in the number that was for a minimum, um, uh, the minimum that they had to use. You'll notice I say one general encyclopedia only, print or online, not both. And I would tell them that they would not count as the total. Okay, in this, this is so this is basically how I grade it on the accuracy and authority of the website. So if they turn in a bogus website or something that just did not have any authority behind it, was written by a middle school student, something of that nature, they would get a zero on that particular part of the rubric. I also graded on their advocacy and objectivity, uh, whether they uh, were representing um, all the different uh, viewpoints if it was a research paper. Current theme coverage, okay, so how detailed was it, how recent was it. Variety of media, I insisted that they use, as you see up here, all types of media, all types of research information, not just the web. And then there was the MLA format and content was the very least of emphasis um, because I felt that the quality of the site was more important. All right, and we'll go back to the bar here. <laughs> All right, so that was the basic um, rubric that I used. Um, All right, guidelines for content creation and Evaluation. Let me see if that's still there. Okay, sorry about that. It was available a while ago. <laughs> Let me just switch back to the evaluation activities. I might have forgotten to update the private page. Yeah, here it is. It is a very it's a great checklist. Um, for baseline requirements for a uh, website, but it's extremely long, very intimidating for high school students. They wouldn't be bothered filling this out, really. You might use it as a exercise with kids, but I just found it um, not to be as useful as it could be. But it was the basis of one that I created for my own students, which I'm going to get to in a little while. This is one of the things that's um, private. It's Tony Bazio's website evaluation gizmo. So this is a much shorter kind of checklist that would fit on a, on a typical piece of paper that you could hand out. And it would be short enough that the kids could circle 
um, yes or no on these different criteria. The one thing that I would say that I would add to it is I would say the uh, site would have to have a minimum number of yeses in order to be acceptable. Kids really need to be able to quantify it after they're done evaluating. So for instance, uh, I'm going to show you the high school one because that's the one I'm more familiar with, but there is a variation for elementary and middle school. <coughs> Sorry. So what I would do, oops, I don't want that, but there it is. Increase that to 150%. All right, so what I had my kids do um, is they would, for every web page, I'm sorry, not every, but for the first web page that they wanted to use for their report, I would make sure that they filled out this very short, evaluation <clears throat> and they would turn it in to me along with a copy of the first page of the website so that I could <clears throat> easily find it myself and take a look at it. And it gives the criteria, it gives them some, asks them some questions and then they get to circle one page or less, one point, two pages, three points, and so on. And I listed organization before author because that sort of trumps author, almost trumps it. Uh, if you cannot find information about the author, but it's National Geographic or PBS or something like that, it's probably reliable. So uh, I put that first. And then if the, I told the kids that if they could not find any information about the author, if the organization was highly reliable, they could circle five points for the author as well. And um, then the last uh, criteria was uh, date related, I believe. Yeah. Then they were to add up how many points. And if it was 16 points or more, your web page is okay to use. And I would tell them if it's less than six points, it still might be an okay website, but there's so much out there. Find a better web page. And that seemed to help focus them on the whole concept. OK, so here's some more information that I probably, some of it I can't, um, some of it's on the other page and some of it isn't. Uh, right now, my school in the middle school and the high school are using the craft test. And um, let me see if I can find the one. OK. The crap test for middle school students. The librarian that was there in the middle school when I was there created this. And there we go. And it's 100, it's 150. And it's a very nice looking form, much nicer than mine, much clearer to read. Um, I said, take a look at this one and see if you can uh, adapt yours uh, in a similar kind of way. All right, and let me go back to here. Now, some uh, elementary and, well, middle school, it's somewhat questionable. Our middle school is getting away with using the word crap, and of course, it's very memorable for kids. So it's great for middle school and high school. Maybe a little iffy for middle school, particularly if you have sixth graders. Um, that's a decision that you have to make yourself. There is another one, let me see if I have it on there. Okay, evaluating RYT hospital website using the REAL protocol. And that stands for read the URL, examine the content, authors or authority, and links on the site. I don't like it as well as the CREP, um, but another alternative that you can use is for sixth graders, if you are a little bit iffy about using the acronym, you can use CARP. Carp are bottom feeder fish, and you might be able to get away with using carp test instead of craft test. So below are evaluation lessons at all grade levels, kindergarten, third through fifth, sixth through eighth, ninth through twelfth. Um, and then there's a couple of other sites uh, that I'm going to show you from here. All right, real or 
this is an activity that I created. Hopefully, it's going to get there. <coughs> um, at the request of a science teacher that we had, because she had um, students come to them to her with questions about a particular um, a particular site. I can't. Oh, right here. They had come with this gen test. Okay, here we are, uh, all about biogenic pets that you buy in bubble wrap, and then you release them, and you feed them, and they are real live pets. Look very, very um, authentic. Kids found it on their own and questioned it, thank goodness. And so she said to me, I'm realizing that there are things out there that are confusing the kids. They're out there just for fun or just to fool people and let's do a lesson. Well, we never actually got around to doing it before I retired. Um, life intervened, but the, the basics of the lesson are here. And basically what our plan was was to divide the classes up into groups, and each group had three different websites. One was a good, it was okay, one was very good, um, and one was a downright hoax kind of thing. So um, each group would work on it and then present to the class what their findings were. So I think you might find that a useful activity for your students. All right, so let's get to accountability. I've made mention of it before. Um, so I'm going to go over here exactly, you know, in more detail about how I held kids accountable for the sources that they chose. Oops. I got that. That's the wrong thing. Here we go. Accountability. All right. Slideshow. Um, start. All right. How to hold students accountable in a cut and paste world? And again, keep in mind that I have a small have a small population. This slide shows outlines the process I use with high school students. It obviously must be adapted for use at younger grades. In a perfect world, teachers and librarians would present information and expectations. Students would shout, hallelujah, thank us for our wisdom, and immediately internalize and act on that great wisdom. Well, I don't know how that would work for you, but yeah, right, this is what I usually see. Reality check, you're looking out at a sea of people who are bored, stiff, and are convinced that what would, uh, would this old lady know about web evaluation, about using the web? We are the experts. So you are going to have to hold, uh, hold them accountable in some way and not just talk to them about the importance of this. Okay, for convenience sake, I through this, I'm going to reference EasyBib in my examples. It's the program I'm most familiar with, and there are many other choices available to you. But EasyBib is what I'm familiar with. And I uh, just began to get a little bit into the <laughs> web evaluation part of their service before I retired. So I can't really speak um, from experience to that particular issue. Um, <clears throat> first thing you need to have to choose the citation format. And if possible, it should be consistent throughout the district so that you're not having to reteach students. Teach students the why and hows of evaluating and citing, so I did that with my PowerPoint and other sources. Emphasize the need for reading and citing a variety of media, media and for evaluating sources before using them. And that's where that work cited rubric I showed you should be helpful. When they know that they're going to be graded, their anxiety level goes up a bit. Okay, steps to accountability. Break your instruction into chunks according to the type of media. So, for instance, we would do in fact, start out with encyclopedias, uh, emphasizing the fact that those are a good source as a beginning source, but uh, not to put a great deal of emphasis on them, but just use it to find keywords and a little basic information about your topic. Then we would go into reference books, both online and print, whole books on top topics online and print databases, and finally, 
I would let them get to the website. Demonstrate each major type of source you want students to use. And I'm just going to mention that uh, our English department was very, very generous with their um, with their time periods. Um, we have um, block scheduling, which means 80 minute periods. And yeah, this project would pretty much take me eight um, 80 minute periods to complete, sometimes a bit longer. And sometimes we would put breaks in between for them to go back to the classroom and do something else and then come back. But make sure you demonstrate every major type resource you want students to learn. Uh, and you limit students to working with one major type of resource per, resource per period. They're going to want to race ahead. But um, limit them when they find a resource really quickly. Insist that they sit down and start working with that resource. They're wonderful about gathering resources. They want, they gallop through that process, but um, it's a little bit uh, trickier getting them to actually use them. And that's often where the teachers um, will be working with them on note taking while I'm working with them on the information literacy kinds of skills. Steps to accountability. Students complete the easy bit form. So in other words, they up, they go online, they complete that easy bit uh, form, and then they print it and hand in the detailed editing page for me to look at at the end of every period. And I would um, correct those in, at night. And it sounds like a lot of work, but it's amazing how quickly that you can go through them. So, you know, this, uh, a completed source would look like that. They would print it and put their name on it. Teacher and or librarian correct the editing page. I say teacher because I know some of you have large classes. You may have to go through this process as a, sort of a model for your teacher. So, um, you, so you would teach her first class, his or her first class, and then the teacher would take over from there. Uh, it may have to be done that way because of the size of your school. Hopefully your schools are smaller and you can be more involved with every class. Um, do not, when you're correcting them, do not give them the right answer. Simply indicate where the student has gone wrong and suggest that they see you as soon as possible. <coughs> Grade each citation. Oh, and I, I just forgot to mention that uh, if the source is not credible, make sure that they know that right off the bat so they know they, well, they have to go out and find another one. Grade each citation. I use a point system. Five points is a perfect, easy bit editing form. Steps to accountability. Oh, and then I, uh, that's part of their grade as well. As well as their final grade on the work cited, um, all the individual homework assignments, quote unquote, are um, counted and graded. During the next period, require students to correct their citation, and when done, students read their source and begin the note taking process. It's helpful to have graphic organizers and other forms to help with this process. If you have premium easy bit, there's an awesome note taking and outline option. Other citation programs offer similar features. I did not have um, premium when I was working. I do know our district has, has uh, gone to that now. <clears throat> Maintain a grade book to keep your students on track. Um, my teachers always include their grades in their final project grade. And uh, actually their, um, their um, semester grade. <clears throat> Have students turn in their completed work cited to you online so that you can use your word processing program to make corrections more easily. Okay, so most of you have some way of doing that. We, um, I had a website that allowed students to um, upload, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Word documents, <coughs> and that made it easy because I could easily check those websites that they used. Do a final grade on the completed works cited list, and feel free to use my works cited rubric, which grades on a percentage grade basis. Um, sound intimidating? <laughs> I'm not going to try to fool you. It is a lot of work. But I'll tell you the payoff is worth every minute of it. As students progress through the grades, it will become easier for them. 
Um, I do remember I walked into the local grocery store one time, and a student that I had a couple of years ago came, well, a year or so ago, and had come leaping up to me. And she said, oh, Mrs. Henry, thank you, thank you, thank you for teaching us about easy bits. She said, I'm in college now, and you wouldn't believe how stupid the kids are. The, t the professor has had to stop and teach them all the stuff that you taught us. And she said, I thought about telling them about easy bits. But I decided not to. I thought I would just end up looking very smart. <laughs> so anyway, they will appreciate it eventually. And they'll hopefully not be so god smashed when they get into a college class that demands scholarly research skills. All right, so I'm going to go back to my website. And that's accountability. Citation made easy is just simply a page with some um, YouTube videos about EasyBiz, and there's several more here. And then it does give you some access to Bidme, which I've heard some people talk about, Noodle Tools, Fun of Citation Machine, and a list of common citation makers. Okay. And the last part is simply uh, something you could skip. It. it was something I had tacked on there for a workshop I was doing for the public library for um, uh, the general public. So um, I think that's pretty much it. Hopefully you are all still awake and you don't look like that student I showed you a little while ago. And uh, that's the advantage of doing a uh, webinar, I guess. I don't see people falling in sleep in front of me. So hopefully you will find a lot of um, resources here that you can go back and use. And let me emphasize again, I will be taking off the um, password protection to this for about 10 days so you can make use of everything that's available there. And then after that, most of the things are still available on evaluation activities. So I thank you for your attention, and I'll turn things over to Emily. Jackie, thank you so much. Um, I am confident that no one has fallen asleep during your presentation today because the chat box has been going nonstop the entire time with lots of positive feedback and discussion and most importantly questions. Um, we do have about 10 minutes left, so I'm just going to ask you um, a couple questions from our users. Um, one person had asked, um, with the accountability uh, rubric that you were going through before, um, did you ever use that when you were teaching uh, middle school age students, or was that something you only did when you were in high school? Oh, gosh, that's going back a few years. Let me think about it. No, I only used it for high school. I got started on it because um, I had a um, high school teacher who was shocked and outraged when his kids turned in papers that were so poorly done and he looked at the um, bibliography and he was just horrified. And I had been kind of noticing um, bad choices from the kids. And so we made it, uh, I made it a, a professional development project that year and that's where that work site is. Uh, came out of, and then I introduced it into high school English. So it was um, it was just I think I started it just the year before I switched from middle school, high school to just high school. Okay, great. Um, we I think my colleague does use it in middle school. I'll have to check with her. We had another, um, I thought this was a really good question. Um, one person asked if you could just comment on the value of going to specific hoax sites, so websites that were just built to be fake, um, because it seems like it might be a better use of time to let students evaluate real websites that uh, they might actually come across when they're doing research. Um, so what, what's your two cents on that? Right. I don't like to put a lot of emphasis on, on that and um, on the hoax site. <clears throat> and I actually tell, uh, had I actually presented this lesson that I showed you, I would have told the kids up front that some of them are going to be blatantly terrible, but one of them is at 
poor to average, and another one is reliable. And uh, I haven't spent time on that. If I were doing a lesson strictly on web evaluation, but what I do mostly is I give them the lesson on web evaluation, and then their requirement is to go out and find a website that is good for their um, project. Sometimes they're successful, sometimes they're not. Sometimes we have to give them a lot of help with that. But I think it is more valuable to spend time on the sites that they are likely to find. Um, a good example of one that they are likely to find is that uh, cocaine.org. That, uh, that shows up frequently towards the top of the results on Google and other sites. And it's definitely one that they have to watch out for that they might not uh, realize at first was not a reliable site. So, yeah, I don't spend a lot of time on hoax sites. They're, they're good for a laugh now and again, but, um, you know, I don't spend a lot of time on it. I do spend time on things like um, sites that look good but are written by students or that look good and have no authors just so they know how to recognize a poor site. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense because um, obviously it makes more sense for students to be going to websites that they're going to come across and then evaluate those and think about, well, is this relevant to my paper? Is this a credible website to go to? Is there even an author? Um, so that seems like a good approach. Um, one question that I wanted to address before um, we wrap it up today, one person asked, and I'm sure many people were thinking this as well, um, do the participants of today's webinar have permission to use um, your resources for library instruction, whether it's the rubrics or the presentations or anything else they might find yes. on your website? Absolutely. Even even the materials on the private site are okay. I have permission to present that to um, uh, to, to give present the information to librarians and for them to use it. Just not put it out on the web in general. Um, what I would tell people is um, don't hesitate to contact me either through the contact form on uh, my website or I can give you my uh, email. And I will give you the, um, the password so that you can continue to use that, to refer to that private page. Because, because you've attended, you know, I can make it fully available to you. Okay? But I just didn't want That's, to put that out on YouTube. <laughs> that makes total sense. Um, and yeah, everybody, you, there is um, a contact form on Jackie's website, so if you want to reach out to her directly, you can do so that way. Um, just for the sake of time, um, I'm actually going to wrap things up. Just to reiterate uh, what we had discussed in the beginning, um, if any of you came in late um, and you needed to catch up on the webinar, we will be sending out a recording um, in a follow-up email. A lot of you also asked for the chat. Um, during the presentation today, Jackie, people were giving other examples of hoax sites. They were sharing different rubrics, um, website evaluation, um, teaching methodologies, things like that. So we'll send that out as well. Um, and for everyone who joined, everyone who joined today will also get a certificate of um, completion. So. Um, if you do have any questions specifically for Jackie, you can always go to her website. We'll, we will link to that in the email as well. Um, if you'd like to go there now, it is wanderingbooknut.meebly.com. Um, Jackie, thank you as always for a wonderful webinar. Once again, for the third or fourth time, we've had a fantastic turnout. Um, and people really find your, your resources valuable. So we really appreciate you um, working with us. Oh, thank you very much. I enjoy it. And thank you um, to everyone who took the time to join us today. Uh, keep an eye out in your inbox uh, for the follow-up email with all of the resources that we discussed today. Um, and thanks so much for joining us. Um, and if you ever have any questions, you can find us on Twitter, Facebook, or um, easybit.com. So thanks again, everyone. Um, yes, Jackie? Um, yes. If people prefer to contact me directly through my email, they can. It's just one wandering book not at gmail.com. Okay, great. So if any of you missed that, Wandering Book Nut, same as Jackie's website title, um, at gmail.com. So you can always shoot her an email 
directly um, to share resources or if you just want to say hello and, and give her some feedback on this fabulous presentation. Um, so I guess that's it. Um, if you guys have any questions, you can always contact us. And thanks so much for joining us. We will be offering um, free professional development webinars uh, every week, um, seemingly infinitely. So uh, keep an eye out in your inbox for additional invitations. We're also posting registrations for those up on Twitter. Um, so we hope to see you again um, at a future PD webinar. And thank you again, Jackie. Um, and have a great